Hello, my name is Henry Gottfried. The subject of my talk today is about the dispersion relation of Landau elementary excitations and the thermodynamical properties of superfluid helium-4. But let me first introduce my team. My collaborators are Katie Beauvois, Ahmad Sultan, Javier Davidovsky, Bjorn Falk, Jacques Olivier, and for the theory, Eckhart Krocek. The work was done at the ILL, the High Neutron Flux Reactor in Grenoble, France. Our results can be found in two recent publications in Physical Review B. The phase diagram of helium-4 is well known in this community. It is superfluid below the lambda point, 2.17 Kelvin, and for pressures between saturated vapor pressure and about 25 bar. The main concepts related to the ground state of helium-4 and the elementary excitations are essentially the Bose-Einstein condensation proposed by London to explain the properties of the superfluid, the two fluid models by TISA in the same year, where normal particles and Bose condensed particles coexist, and the more elaborate model by Landau, where you have a gas of phonon and roton excitations in the superfluid, and these excitations carry the entropy. The thermal properties can then be calculated by statistical physics with a model of the dispersion curve. In Landau's model, we have a quantization of the density fluctuations, that is sound essentially, with a linear branch, the phonon branch, in the energy versus momentum of these fluctuations, and the parabolic minimum at finite wave vector or finite momentum, which is the roton part of the spectrum. This was a phenomenological theory by Landau, very fruitful, but a different line was taken by Feynman, and Feynman made the really the microscopic theory, the beginning of the microscopic theory of helium, and using physical arguments, he could find the way to explain this phonon roton dispersion curve of the excitations of helium. He suggested also the use of neutron scattering to observe this dispersion relation in helium-4 because no one had seen that. Neutrons can create quantum excitations in matter by transferring momentum and energy. The momentum and energy lost by the neutron correspond to the momentum and the energy of the excitation that has been created in the superfluid helium in this case. Real life is slightly more complicated and here in the foreground you can see the IN5 instrument where the experiment has been done at the ILL. Here comes the description of the IN5 time of flight spectrometer. Neutrons packets are prepared by the choppers. They fly until they reach the sample in this blue area here. Then they, uh, the scattered neutrons, which have lost some energy and changed direction because of the change in momentum, will reach different detectors in different angles at different times because of their slower velocity. This is the principle of the time of flight spectrometer. A legitimate question is what is new in the present neutron experiment? First of all, cryogenics is done at extremely low temperatures, the temperature is well below 0.1 Kelvin, and the cell ensures good thermal contact. Second, and this is the major advance, it's the IN5 thermal flight spectrometer has a new highly pixelized detector bank covering 30 square meters with 10 to the 5 pixels. There is also a new large detector chamber under vacuum, no helium gas, which would spoil the resolution at low energies. The analysis is done with a new program that analyzes pixel by pixel, that is, we have 10 to the 5 independent detectors which cover this, as you can see in the picture on the right, different angles, and there are many, many pixels for a given angle. 
This gives us an unprecedented accuracy in the whole energy and momentum range and also because we have we are able to treat statistical errors very easily but also we have done a big effort treating systematic errors and this is not often done in this kind of measurements. Here we see the results of our measurements of the dynamic structure factor in all the wave vector and energy range. You can see at low energies, in the lower part of the graph, the famous landau phonon roton dispersion curve of single excitations, and above, which much more intensity, see the scale on the right-hand side, the multi-excitations, which extend at higher energy until they reach the free helium atom dispersion. We have with this a complete map of the excitations of superfluid helium-4. Here we see the measured dispersion curve. It looks very similar to what Landau had foreseen. You have the linear phonon part, the roton minimum, what is called the maxon maximum, and also the Pitayevsky plateau at twice the roton gap at the highest energies. There is a termination point of this Pitayevsky plateau and the intensity goes down very fast as seen in the contour plot on the right. In this contour plot you see the end of the Pitayevsky plateau. An important point is to compare the present measurement of the dispersion relation two formal measurements done also by neutron scattering. As you can see on this deviation plot in the low right-hand side panel, you can see that typical deviations are on the order of 2 to 6 percent, which is relatively large. Our data are much more accurate than any formal measurement done in all the range of the dispersion relation. The measurements have also been done at other pressures from 0 to 24 bars and you can see the roton going down with pressure, the maxon, this region here, going up with pressure and being a little bit damaged here because it hits the 2 delta region where some strong attenuation occurs. At low pressures the phonon dispersion is anomalous as seen on the phase velocity plot on the right hand side. This, the red curve corresponds to zero pressure. The dispersion becomes normal at uh, high pressures, the dark green curve on the top. You see that there is now an excellent agreement between the low wave vector ultrasonic measurements and the high wave vector neutron scattering measurements. And this is new. Once you have the dispersion relation, you can use statistical physics and calculate all the thermal properties using a Debye-style formalism. Of course, you have to use Bose-Einstein statistics and you have two possible methods. One is, as Landau did, to make a, a parametrization of the phonon branch that is a linear term plus some deviations proportional to the momentum and the other type of excitations, the rotons, they have a gap and you can then have a parabolic dispersion around. Here we have done this kind of fits with the phonon branch and uh, also with the rotons but going much higher in uh, momentum description because there is a large asymmetry of the roton minimum and there is also a large deviation from a simple parabolic minimum. The other method is, is since we have the whole dispersion curve we can just numerically integrate the whole dispersion curve to get the thermodynamic properties. The first method of course depends on a few parameters, it's sometimes easier, but the second one is of course more precise. With the measured dispersion curve, we can calculate many thermal properties of the superfluid helium-4. For instance, here we have the specific heat, where the energy can be calculated as an integral over all the modes on the dispersion curve, and of course the Bose factor, 
the integral is carried from zero momentum to the end of the Pitayevsky plateau, which is determined here quite accurately. You can see on the left hand side the specific heat as a function of temperature in a log plot, semi log plot. You can see the individual Fonen and Roten contributions and also the obviously total heat capacity measured by Phillips or Graywall in classical measurements. At high temperatures, there are deviations which come from roton roton interactions not considered in our calculation. On the right hand side, you can see an expanded view where we compare these experimental heat capacity measurements to the neutron calculated, the specific heat calculated using the dispersion curve. You can see that neutron scattering is doing even a better job than the direct measurements. Here I show another example of what can be calculated in the thermodynamical properties. This is the normal density, and in particular the normal density at low temperatures, which is a useful quantity. We can also compare our measured dispersion curve, represented here with a thick black line, to theoretical calculations of the dispersion curve, starting from the original Feynman curve, here at the top of the graph, and then more recent calculations by Diffusion Monte Carlo, Path Integral Monte Carlo, and Dynamic Many-Body Theory, which is a microscopic theory. I will briefly mention here two recent applications of the properties of superfluid helium. One has to do with nano-objects interacting with superfluid helium. Here you have some recent uh, references, and the same for superfluid helium particle detectors. We finally reached the conclusions. As we have seen, the neutron scattering has achieved substantial progress, in particular in time-of-flight techniques. We have measured the dispersion relation, and thanks to this, the thermodynamical properties of superfluid helium-4 could be calculated with excellent accuracy from absolute zero to approximately 1.3 Kelvin. Quantum fluids at very low temperatures provide, in addition, essential input for phenomenological, Monte Carlo, and microscopic many-body theories. The experimental results we have obtained are in excellent agreement with dynamical many-body theory calculations. Thank you.